All right. Praise the Lord. We're live here from Central Florida. Welcome to Right Division Ministries. My name is Brother Mike Hallner. I'm a Bible teacher in Central Florida. I'm the author of the KJV debate and the mid-tribulational rapture of the church. So prophecy, Bible prophecy lovers, stay tuned. We're going to give you something very exciting here. Both titles can be uh, available on Amazon or on my website at kjvdebate.com. So we're going to offer something very exciting here. I enjoy teaching on Bible prophecy. This is going to be part one of Lord knows how many series this will be. And we're going to go over a few important keys to unlocking Bible prophecy. And one of the things I want to say up front is that, you know, Bible prophecy and eschatology is not a, not a matter of salvation. It, it's a very, very important doctrine, but uh, it's not as important as the word of God and, and, you know, what our beliefs are on the King James Bible and so forth. And we're not going to make this a King James Bible issue, although there are uh, some recommendations on that in this particular series. So this is part one of understanding Bible prophecy and the mid-tribulational rapture. There's just a few keys we're going to go over here that among many important keys that the, the first key is what I call the key of proper interpretation of scripture according to Isaiah 28, 9 through 13. We highly recommend at least 500 King James Bible scriptural uh, verses or references on Bible prophecy. And the reason being is that 30% of scripture relates to Bible prophecy. So we're going to, when we're going to talk about the timing of the rapture or when Christ comes or anything that's related to eschatology it is highly recommended that you, you, you take at least a couple hundred verses, if not 500 to a thousand verses in combining what all the books of the Bible have to say on that particular subject. And this key we'll go over a little bit more, but it's very important to have a, a very large arsenal of scriptural references when, when you're dealing with uh, the timing of the rapture, the second coming of the things to come. The second key is what I call the fast forward. Um, I think a lot of Christians get confused over the fact and not, and not realizing that the book of Revelation uh, sometimes takes a panoramic look ahead and back in time, similar to what you would see in a movie scene um, where the director will take you fast forward in time, then go back in time. Of course, with the book of Revelation, we have Holy Ghost authorship. So I believe that a few of the examples that I'm going to show you will alleviate some of the confusion when it comes to the book of Revelation. Although it is in chronological order, it's not in perfect chronological order. And we're going to show you that the seals, the trumpets and the vials are in order but you're going to find out that some of the seals and trumpets actually take a look ahead. And I think that this is going to be a very important key. And the third key, and, and believe me, there's a lot more than three keys. We're just going over three today. The third key, which is very important also, is understanding the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of Christ. Matthew 24, chapter 24, is not the rapture. And chapter 25 is an extension of Matthew chapter 24. So we have to realize that the rapture versus the second coming or the day of the Lord are two different events with two different time frames. Now, in 2 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, um, in the King James Bible, it, it mentions that the day of Christ, um, you know, don't be deceived as letters from us as the day of Christ is at hand. And then Paul goes on to say that there's certain things that need to take place before that day of Christ can come, which is the rapture. Unfortunately, the modern Bibles mix up the day of Christ with the day of the Lord. And there is a slight disadvantage in Bible prophecy to not having a King James Bible. But like I said, I'm not going to make this a King James Bible issue, but it is a, it's an undeniable fact that there's a lot of biblical verses of relating to prophecy that are distorted in the modern versions. And we can show you that down the road. So it's very important to understand the difference between the day of the Lord and the day of Christ. These are two different events that take place. Now, as far as key number one in Isaiah 28, 9 through 13, it says precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here little and there little. 
And unfortunately, you will need a King James Bible for these particular verses in Isaiah 28, 9 through 13, because it's distorted in the other versions. And it starts out in verse 9, whom shall he teach knowledge and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? You have to be weaned from the milk and drawn away from the breast. So if you want to get off the milk of the word and get into the meat, get yourself a King James Bible, study and memorize Isaiah 28, 9 through 13. And then we highly recommend a minimum of at least 500 verses of scripture relating to Bible prophecy when we're going to talk about timing. Now, it's very important to understand this meaning in Isaiah 28, 9 through 13, how precept must be upon precept, line upon line, here scripture and there scripture. I mean, you can take a verse like John eleven thirty five, 35, where Jesus wept. Obviously, you don't really need the context of scripture very much, although the Gospel of Luke does reveal a little more context. But you have the shortest verse in the Bible that we know who it is and we know what he done. It's Jesus Christ and he wept. So obviously you don't need much context there. Now, when you get the Bible prophecy in 1 Corinthians 15, 52, obviously the apostle Paul tells us that the rapture will specifically take place at the last trump. But if you look at Revelation 10, 7, it's very easy to identify where that last trumpet sounds in the book of Revelation. And one of the keys to it, it says, when the seventh angel shall begin the sound, the mystery of God should be finished. So how do we know that this is the rapture? Well, you can take Ephesians 5.32, where Paul says this is a great mystery, coinciding with Revelation 10.7 and 1 Corinthians 52. And he, he says, this is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Now, are we going to just take these three verses to build a doctrine, a mid-tribulational doctrine? No, we're not. We're going to take hundreds of verses, Okay. My book has a minimum of 500 scripture, scripture verses pointing towards uh, the mid-tribulational rapture. And then you have to realize that it's not just the 500 verses, but there's other verses in Daniel and Revelation. We have to understand what the gospels say. You need the book of Zechariah. Um, you can't understand 2 Second, Second Thessalonians without 1 Corinthians. Then you need the book of Malachi. You need Habakkuk even the Psalms and Proverbs. I mean, basically you need Genesis to Revelation, the entire context of scripture. In fact, when I update my book, I'm probably going to have closer to 750 to 1,000 verses of scripture when I end up doing one day an extensive dissertation on end time Bible prophecy. So we can't just take a dozen or two verses. We, we've got to take hundreds and hundreds of verses to be able to understand Bible prophecy. Now, the, the mid-tribulational rapture is, is really not very complicated. If you look at the chart here, you have the first three and a half years, which is God's judgments, and then the last three and a half years is God's wrath. It is divided up. You have the tribulation during the first three and a half years. The last three and a half years, you have the great tribulation. The first three and a half years, you have God's judgments. The last three and a half years is God's wrath. Then you have the rapture, which is the day of Christ at the midpoint right here. But over here in the last three and a half years is called the day of the Lord. Now, if you look at the book of Revelation, the last three and a half years with the seven vials of God's wrath does not start physically until Revelation 16 and 1. Now, some of the seals and the trumpets will take a look ahead here, and that's what we're going to show you. Another thing that is missed out on a lot of these uh, type of debates is the talk of restoration. A lot of, a lot of people don't realize that th those th first three and a half years is not the great tribulation. It's not God's wrath, but it's a time of God's judgments. Yes, but it, yes, it is, but it's mixed in with restoration with the two prophets of Revelation 11 and with an army that God is going to raise up in this end time. It has to do with Habakkuk 2, 1 through 5. I suggest that you read that as a side reference. So, repent ye therefore, Acts three nineteen, and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. When the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. So, God has an end time restoration coming. And God the Father will not send Jesus Christ back until this is fulfilled. It's God's end time restoration. And he shall send Jesus Christ, which before was preached unto you, Acts 3.21, whom the heaven must receive until 
the times of restitution of all things, which God had spoken by the mouth of all his holy prophets since the world began. So God the, the Father is holding back Christ from coming back until the times of restitution of all things. So if we take it precept upon precept, we can see there are certain things that need to come to pass before Jesus Christ can come for his bride at the rapture. And once, once again, I said in Revelation 16, 1, if you read the book of Revelation, you can find out that this is the physical, actual current event time when God's wrath begins to take place. Now, as far as agreeing with the pre-tribulational, uh, my brethren out there that are pre-trib, we both agree that we are not appointed unto wrath. God is going to deliver us from the wrath of the last three and a half years of his severe judgments. It's going to be much more than judgments. It's going to be wrath. And we're not, we're not going to be here for that. God is going to take us out before that wrath and before the day of the Lord. So we still have that same comfort that the pre-tribulational uh, believers have. We do not believe that we will be here for the, for the worst part of the great tribulation. Yes, there'll be some judgments, but don't forget, there's going to be a great restoration. And this is what's missing out, along with those two prophets of Revelation, spearheading God's end time plan. Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that he may run that readeth it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come. So this is you know, something that we got to realize that if Jesus could come today, he would come today. I personally wish he would come today so that we can leave this mess of a world behind us for frankly, I'm ready to go. And I wish, I honestly wish I was wrong on this teaching. I went to Bible college years ago in the eighties with an NIV in hand, and I believed in a pre-tribulational rapture. But I ended up studying the issue, and, and I found out that there was a lot of scriptures that were not fulfilled that needed to occur before Jesus could come. So I ask you to take a closer look at that. Now, if you look here, and this is one of the keys we're talking about, how the book of Revelation often take, takes a look ahead in time, kind of like a movie director in a movie scene, scene going ahead or going back in time, one of the keys to understanding uh, for instance, here is in Revelation 6, 12, we can see the sixth seal is being opened where there was a great earthquake and every mountain and island were moved out of their place. And it's talking about the wrath of God. If you look over to Revelation 16, you can clearly see that the sixth seal is taking a look ahead and does a fast forward into time to actually when it actually occurs in Revelation 16, when God's wrath begins. So I think if believers can understand that there's a panoramic view, that it's not always in perfect chronological order, it kind of takes looks ahead. I think that'll help you in your understanding. Here's another example we can see in Revelation 7, that we have a portion of this chapter in chapter 7 that is looking ahead in time to Revelation chapter 21, when the event actually takes place. It's a panoramic view. It's a fast forward look ahead. God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and God will dwell among them and be with them. That doesn't actually happen in Revelation chapter seven. It doesn't occur until Revelation 21, two, when the holy city, New Jerusalem, New Jerusalem comes down. So we can clearly see in this example here that Revelation chapter seven is taking a look ahead to when the event actually occurs in Revelation chapter 21. Now here's another example. Here we have an example of the six trumpets sounding in Revelation 9, 13, and 14, looking ahead as to when the sixth angel pours out the vial of wrath upon the Euphrates River, when the event actually does play, take place a few years later in Revelation 16 and 12. And here we have the angel sounding. Um, the sixth angel had the trumpet, and he's, he says, loose the four angels which are bound in the great river Euphrates. But the event does not physically take place until the wrath of God in Revelation 16, 12, when the river is actually dried up. So here we have another panoramic view, like a movie scene, looking ahead in time. The Euphrates River does not dry up in Revelation chapter 9. It doesn't, it, it, it dries up in Revelation chapter 16. So I think that this is one of the reasons 
that are a lot of Christians are co so confused about the book of Revelation or Bible prophecy is that they don't see these panoramic views, um, the looks ahead, the looks back. And I think that's one of the reasons for confusion. And as I stated, some of the confusion for Christians is that both the seals and the trumpets can take a look ahead in time into the vials of, of God's wrath, whereas the vials of God's wrath, which is the last three and a half years and doesn't start till Revelation 16 and 1, the wrath of God does not need to look ahead, the vials, for they are now current events. They're currently taking place at this junction, which starts in Revelation 16, 1, when the wrath of God physically begins. So I think if we can understand this key here, that it will really help us with Bible prophecy and help us to see some of the timing of future events. Now, the other key is very important is that Matthew chapter 24 is not the rapture. It's very clear from the context of scripture that Matthew 24 is not the rapture. It's not the day of Christ. It's referring to the day of the Lord. Matthew chapter 24 must coincide also with Matthew chapter 25. And Isaiah is the day of the Lord from Isaiah chapter 13. Matthew chapter 24 does not have a single reference to the day of Christ, the last trumpet of revelation, or us being caught up together in the clouds with the Lord. It is Jesus Christ's literal second coming to earth three and a half years after the rapture. So this is a very important key. And as you can see from the chart, the day of the Lord in Isaiah Chapter 13 coincides with Matthew chapter 24, with the sun being darkened, the moon loses its light, uh, cosmic changes in the heavens, but the heavens being shaking, men's heart failing them, all nations are involved. If you compare it with the chart, you can clearly see that Matthew chapter 24 is relating to the day of the Lord in Isaiah chapter 13, among many, many hundreds of other scriptures. So I think if you can get that, it'll help. Here's a couple more. Jesus Christ's second coming to earth compared to Matthew chapter 24. Zechariah, where it says all nations uh, versus Jerusalem, just as in Luke 21, 20, which coincides with Matthew 24. It's another uh, one of the synoptic gospels, another view of Matthew 24, where all nations will gather against Jerusalem. There's a great mourning and Jesus is seen in the clouds, which is in Matthew chapter 24, but it's also backed up by Zechariah, Revelation, and Daniel. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, here a scripture, there a scripture. So we can clearly see that Matthew chapter 24 is not the rapture. It's talking about the day of the Lord, the second coming of Christ. Even the disciples asked Jesus in Matthew 24, 3, as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? So Christ responded in chapter 24 and 25 of Matthew. Don't forget, you need Matthew chapter 25 too to understand Matthew chapter 24 with hundreds of other scriptures that go along with this. So it's talking about the end of the world. It's not talking about the day of Christ when Jesus comes. Now, you got to love eschatology. I mean, my, my, my friend and brother Nick Sayers, a uh, good brother in the Lord, the King James Bible advocate, and I love him. And he just recently had, had a uh, uh, debate, a pre-wrath rapture debate uh, against uh, uh, brother Jonathan here. I forgot his last name. And of course, I gave my review on the right side, which a lot of things were missing. But uh, Nick is pre-tribulation and 60, I took this survey back in Bible college back in the eighties, long time ago. So the statistics might be a little different now, but pre-tribulational uh, uh, believers that believe the rapture can happen at any day now are 62% of the body of Christ. Um, Pre-wrath, which um, Jonathan holds to, which believes that it will happen somewhere between like five and a quarter way into it. Um, I disagree with both positions, along with uh, the uh, Nick's upcoming debate with uh, Pastor Tommy uh, McMurtry. Um, he post, he's post-tribulational. 
And 18% of the body of Christ believes that. And of course, the mid-tribulational view, you're only going to have about 7%. So mid-tribulation is uh, in, in a minority position. Um, however, with that said, the pre-wrath position um, and the mid-trib are the closest, although I believe that the pre-wrath uh, position has a weakness along with the other positions and not being able to identify uh, the last trump as, as the mid-tribulation uh, rapture actually points to it in Revelation 10, 7, and we can see it also all the way up to Revelation 12, 5. And so that that's, you know, some of the things that are missing there. But let us remember, um, and I've said this before, eschatology is very important. It is very important. And it's a lot of fun putting the pieces of the puzzle together. However, the spiritually mature do recognize <laughs> that it is not a matter of salvation. So please, don't cast me or any other brother or sister into hell if we don't believe, uh, you know, in your eschatological position as to the timing of future events. So, you know, it really is is it's 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 very important. But let's not pat, cast people into the lake of fire for in disagreement. So, the day of Christ, the rapture versus the day of the Lord during God's wrath at, at Christ's second coming. We have to understand that difference. The rapture is distinct from the second advent. The rapture, as you know, 1 Thessalonians 4 and 1 Corinthians 15 states is at the last trump. The second coming is a different event. Christ comes in the air at the rapture. Christ physically returns to the earth at the second coming. At the rapture, Christ comes for his saints. At the second coming, Christ comes with his saints. And all the scriptures are up in this chart for you to reference. And it's, it's pretty amazing, really, when you take precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, um, you can kind of see the reason why uh, my book ended up with 500 verses of scripture. Um, you need hundreds of verses uh, from Genesis to Revelation to be able to understand, um, you know, the rapture versus the second coming, that these are two events that are three and a half years apart. Um, so I want to thank you for listening to this part one. This is short. Um, these keys are very important. I will say that, that this is one of the most enjoyable things that, um, uh, I have been studying since my Bible college days. It's been almost 40 years of, of Bible study on prophecy. Um, the King James version debate, I've, I've got maybe 20 years under my belt on that, but Bible prophecy. I mean, when I first got saved in 1983, I, I immediately opened the book of Revelation. I was fascinated with future events and some of the things to come. So I say this is part one in a series. This is going to be, I mean, to go through Bible prophecy, you would need a hundred part series to even scratch the surface because 30% of the Bible is, is Bible prophecy. So I, I hope it has helped a little bit with these keys. Um, it is an important doctrine. I believe that it's mid-tribulational, and I believe that the vast majority of the, the scriptures will point to that. So I want to thank you for your time. I hope this has been edifying to you. Um, just remember that these three things are very important among many others, is that you have to have the context of scripture, at least maybe 500 verses of scriptural references when you deal with the timing of future events. Understand that the book of Revelation takes looks ahead um, and sometimes even back in time like a movie scene. And then the third key is to understand the difference between the day of Christ and the day of the Lord. So I hope this has been edifying. Uh, give me your feedback in your comments. Um, I'll answer any of your questions on this and there's going to be a lot more to come. I hope this has been enjoyable and we have just scratched the surface. So I want to thank you guys and God bless you. Have a wonderful day and I hope this has been enjoyable. We'll see you soon in the Lord. Amen.